Hey there, everyone. Today, we dive into the history of sous vide, innovations in the kitchen, and how technology is constantly changing cooking. Next on Exploring Sous Vide. I'm going to Jason logs in. I'm going to double check that we are live here. Want to make sure we are showing up properly. We have an amazing guest today and want to make sure you get every moment of it. Looks like we are indeed good to go there. So if you're joining us, please say hi in the comments. Let us know where you're from and what you have been up to lately. I wonder if it's pouring rain where you are as much as it is where I am. Hopefully the thunder doesn't knock out the power. If it does, then you'll have a nice one-on-one -on -one session with today's guest. So hey there, I'm Jason Logston and this is Exploring Sous Vide. We're all about helping you get the most out of your sous vide machine while talking to some of the biggest names in the industry. Today's episode is brought to you by my very own sous vide made easy video course because sous vide isn't magic. Like most cooking methods, gaining confidence comes from a little bit of knowledge combined with a whole lot of practice. Once you understand a surprisingly small amount of basic information, you'll be able to trust yourself to regularly turn out amazing food with sous vide. And to help you get started, I've assembled all the information you need to know into this comprehensive video course. More than 15,000 people have used this information to level up their sous vide game. It's broken up into bite-sized chunks, moving you along at a pace you can easily keep up with, even with your busy schedule. So level up your sous vide game today at afmeasy.com slash made easy. Got people joining us. Mark Webb is joining us. Lisa Keys, two of my favorite people in the ISVA. Got Australia and Pennsylvania. It's nice uh, already representing the globe. Remember, all of these episodes are available as a podcast on your favorite podcast player, or you can join us live when we record these episodes. You can ask the guest questions, talk to the other cooks in the comments, and even see our smiling faces. So join us at afmeasy.com slash show, or search for Exploring Sous Vide on your favorite podcast platform. Now, on to the show. Sous vide is all about taking an existing technology and applying it to our cooking to create novel results. It's not the only way to push boundaries in the kitchen, though, and luckily, today's guest is the perfect person to help us out. He is the president of PolyScience and an avid inventor and home cook. He helped pioneer sous vide cooking and has brought several laboratory techniques to the kitchen. He's appeared as a judge on Iron Chef America and presented on The Next Iron Chef. He's been featured in Food & Wine, Time, and Newsweek. He's won the Star Chefs Award for Technology, the Food Network's Tasty Technology Award, the Madrid Fusion Technology Award, Cannabis and Tech Innovation Award, Laser Focus World Innovation Award, and of course, the most important one, I'm sure, to his heart, the ISVA Bruno Gasalt Champion of Sous Vide Award. So I can't, well, can't wait to learn from today's guest, the president of PolyScience, Philip Preston. Philip, welcome to Exploring Sous Vide. Thank you, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so great having you on. I know everyone over here is excited to hear from you. We got uh, Mark Webb, who's the aroma science guy out of Australia, does some amazing stuff with sous vide and aroma. Lisa Keys, who uses sous vide in some really innovative baking ways. She does entire cakes using sous vide, um, even in sealed bags sometimes. She does some really cool stuff there. Um, we got uh, Kevin Liddell, who is our favorite snarky commenter. Uh, Rosemary Simpson does a lot of great stuff with ice cream and has done some really cool things for us as well. So some of our favorites are joining us, and I'm sure they're going to have lots of great questions about your background, about how you use sous vide. But before we get to all that, I always like to ask, what is it like around your dinner table on a typical day? Well, you know, even though uh, sous vide's been a huge part of my life, uh, I look at it, it's just one more arrow in the quiver. You know, I still, God, I still love my barbecue. I still love, uh, you know, every other method there is. Uh, so, you know, it, it's um, it's pretty normal, actually. Uh, I, I'd say maybe uh, the I try to keep the bar a little higher, uh, but, it, you know, I just, I love all types of cooking. What's your go-to meal when you're like, I'm just craving this, and it's like kind of a homey go-to meal for you? Well, it's funny because my son is graduating tomorrow from eighth grade, and uh, you know there were there's all these eighth grade parties, and I said, you know what, what do you want to do? Uh, you know, I'll, whatever it is is fine. He said, I want to come home, and I want to have roast chicken with uh, wild rice and broccoli. And then a key lime pie. Yeah, so that's probably one of the go-tos. 
One of my go-tos with sous vide though is uh, uh, my daughter's favorite meal is uh, uh, a nice uh, New York uh, steak, 136 degrees. Uh, and then uh, I'll pre-sear and poile afterwards, uh, cover that in morel sauce, doing the Joel Robuchon mashed potatoes. <laughs> And uh, you know, maybe some green beans on the side with some uh, sliver, toasted slivered uh, uh, almonds. Doesn't get any better. That's a lot fancier than what uh, my typical meal is around our dinner table. <laughs> that sounds incredible. Uh, I definitely agree about like, you know, roast chicken and like something like that is I love chicken sous vide and that's how I cook it a lot. But like there's something about like a whole roast chicken or a rotisserie chicken that just the look and the feel and like everything around it is just, you can't replicate that. Yeah. Yeah. I like the ringtone. That's a, uh, I should use that for like every intro to the, to the show. That'd be perfect. <laughs> yeah. My James Bond intro. <laughs> so you really pioneered the use of sous vide in restaurant kitchens and home kitchens. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about? It's such a fascinating story. Well, yeah, it's it was uh, you know totally out of the blue, and uh, uh, Matthias Murgis, who was chef de cuisine at Charlie Trotter's, called Poly Science. Now, Poly Science has been a lab business since my father founded it in 1963. Our specialty is precise temperature control, but you know this really meant controlling the temperature of uh, viscometers, refractometers, spectrophotometers. Um, AA furnaces, that type of thing. And Matthias calls and says, you know, I'm interested in using this to cook with. And uh, Karen, and it was still with us, of course, in customer service, uh, said, you know, I don't know anything about using our equipment for cooking, but our president loves to cook. And uh, she knew that I had actually studied French cooking for a couple of years and, you know, really, you know, viewed it as a serious hobby. And I talked with Matthias and I said, you know, this is great. I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll, I'll come by. And uh, he had explained to me that uh, he had learned about this technique in France and he wanted to start utilizing this at Charlie Trotter's. And uh, I thought, this is great. You know, I get to combine my, my career and my hobby. You know, it doesn't get any better. And Matthias is uh, such a wonderful and talented guy that it was just too much fun not to work with him. <laughs> yeah, just, just we, we had a great time. We hit it off. And uh, uh, I think I have to figure out how to turn, my, turn this thing off. But <laughs> okay, well, well, I'll figure that out. Anyway, um, you know, we, we just had a great time. And I actually didn't know, you know, what he was getting at. And so I started thinking, um, okay, well, this is like brazing. And, and in many ways it is. Mm -hmm. But I made the mistake of trying, you know, okay, I talked with him about it. And then I went home and I said, well, I normally I might braise like lamb shank. So I bought some lamb shank, put them in a bag, vacuum sealed it. And back then there wasn't anything on times and temperatures. <laughs> Uh, you know, there was the, uh, there was a book, um, the Roca book in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, but at least I could, I can tell when it has a degree centigrade <laughs> afterwards. Okay. And, you know, in, in looking back on that, the times and temperatures were, had nothing to do with food safety. Okay. And, and the ingredients had nothing to do with what you'd find in Chicago. You know, this might have been, it worked in Barcelona, it didn't work in Chicago. Um, and so I cooked my lamb shank at what I kind of guessed was right. And they were absolutely horrible. <laughs> and one of the things that I learned about sous vide is it really intensifies flavor, but it intensifies the good and the bad. And so if, if something has sort of a naturally gamey uh, characteristic to it, it will really bring that gaminess out. <laughs> okay. And so um, 
I met with Matthias again and I, I shared my tale of woe. And, and it was, thank goodness, I, I keep chickens. They loved it. So it didn't go to waste. <laughs> and um, he, ga- he gave me a vacuum seal bag of some, uh, I think it was a Tasmanian sea bass or something like that. And, uh, and um, he said, just put it in a bath, this time, this temperature. And it was absolutely spectacular. That's when I really got it. Okay, I said, okay, now... Now I see what this is about. I know what he's talking about. Uh, unfortunately, though, there was just nothing out there. So um, I started, you know, interacting with more and more chefs and uh, actually went out to New York and met with Dorothy Hamilton, who was the founder of the French Culinary Institute, uh, because I had learned that uh, she had she was doing some work in this area, or at least she had people on, on staff that were working in this area. One of the guys, Dominic Cerrone, and then Dave Arnold. Now, Dave Arnold was like, as far as I know, he was the first guy to teach sous vide in a culinary school. Hmm. And uh, so he was just, you know, again, the two of us hit it off. And, and he really, you know, was willing to share a lot of information with me and I'd share what I knew with him. And, uh, you know, so I, I viewed it then as, okay, now how do we get this information out there? And it, it was quite funny. We, we set up, and I think it was 2005 was our first booth at the national restaurant association show. And we got a little 10 foot booth in the basement. <laughs> and, and the basement tended to be where all the new companies were. And so actually a lot of people would go down there just to kind of see, well, what's coming, what's new. All the and old companies, companies are down, down there. there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and no one knew what the heck we were talking about. And, and actually now this, uh, at this point, I had actually gone past just sous vide. Um, I had designed uh, the anti griddle for Grant Ackett's because, you know, Grant at that time, he was working with uh, the rest, doing the recipe development for Alinea. And he was doing that out of Nick Kikonis' kitchen, uh, which is literally, you know, back then Nick lived uh, a half a mile from me. So, um, you know, he was, he was working on it here in the suburbs or Chicago suburbs while they were doing the build out of Alinea. And Grant and, and Nick had come out to Poly Science, and uh, he saw that I built a lot of refrigeration systems. And uh, he had heard about a product uh, that I think Ferran was using, the Tepin Nitro is what Ferran called it. And it was just a really, really cold metal plate that he could freeze things, unidirectionally freeze things very rapidly. And so... Uh, I ended up designing and building the anti-griddle for Grant. I I, I didn't expect to ever sell any of them, honestly. I built, you know, I thought I'd build two of them, one for him, one for me, and that would be it. And uh, and we sold, you know, I'm not going to say tens of thousands, but we sold a few thousand of those uh, to those really engaged, uh, you know, chefs that wanted to push the envelope. But, uh, you know, so we, we kept kind of expanding and expanding into the sous vide category and trying to figure out, you know, what, what it is that customers wanted, what restaurants wanted. Um, and at that point, it was really just the, the very, very high end restaurants. You know, I was really just working with guys like, uh, you know, the Charlie Trotters, the Alinea. Uh, Wiley Dufresne at WD50 and uh, Jean Georges and Thomas Keller. And, uh, you know, those were the only guys doing this, you know, because it was really kind of the secret weapon of the high end chef. So, um, um, what's, what's one of the most interesting, interesting things, things you've, you've made, made with, with the, the anti griddle? Well, for me, actually, my favorite thing to do with it is uh, every one of my kids experiences, I bring it into their classroom and make uh, um, 
I am kind of known for my uh, rosemary caramel creme anglaise. And so I'd make creme anglaise lollipops with this kind of fun, more adult rosemary caramel flavor. And I'd bring it into my kids, you know, like whatever, sixth grade classroom and, and uh, do a demonstration of, you know, various laboratory things. And I'd show them how they could be fun. And uh, so I'd make uh, lollipops for the kids, uh, you know, because I could knock out a, a dozen lollipops every two minutes on the anti-griddle. So that was always my favorite thing. That's a great use for it. I love, uh, you know, taking these things that they're using at, you know, $200, $300 a meal uh, restaurants. And like, they're also great for making lollipops. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and for the, those of you listening, is my sound better now? I turned my mic on and off. So hopefully I was getting some reverb there for a minute. Uh, Mark Webb, let me know. Um, hopefully it sounds a little bit better. I was, I was hearing it too. And I was like, I wonder if that's out there in the world that I'm just super loud in front of everyone suddenly. <laughs> so you put together the anti-griddle. You were helping sous vide with, as you said, just a handful of chefs who just happen to be some of the top chefs in the entire world. Uh, where did you kind of... What was the most interesting use you saw of it kind of in those early days that you might not have been expecting to work out well, but was a really interesting way to like approach it? Well, you know, I kept learning, you know, from uh, people about, uh, you know, how they're using sous vide. And um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity, Harold McGee came by and, and, paid a visit. And I always thought it was uh, one of the more interesting things that he shared with me was um, his step cooking technique for sweet potatoes. I, I always just love that concept that, uh, you know, bringing sweet potatoes, I got to double check my, my temperatures here, but you know, he would, uh, it was through his, uh, his input actually is ended up in my cookbook. That's what I'm looking at here. And he would say, you know, you take the sweet potatoes and vacuum seal them and then bring them up to uh, 67 centigrade and hold them there for two hours and then take them up to uh, uh, 85 centigrade and break them down, uh, you know, over a couple hours. But uh, he said that there was an enzyme reaction that occurred uh, to convert more sugar. And I don't know, I didn't necessarily believe it. Okay, I was a little skeptical. But um, actually, uh, and, and you could talk to Dave Petranzik about this one. Uh, uh, Dave's actually proven this out as well, where you take them and you try this technique versus just going 85 and normally cook them in the bag. And then when you, if you roasted them in the oven, the ones that you did that step cook will like almost caramelize on the outside. Whereas the ones you didn't, uh, you know, it just looks like a roasted potato. And so, you know, I think the, that there is some, some logic there and that you actually are converting more sugar. So uh, I always thought that was really kind of fun because it brings that, you know, kind of crazy science of, because it, what it gets me thinking about is, you know, there's probably a hundred other things that if I ever thought to step cook, or, you know, if I knew there was an enzyme reaction that happens in this 10 degree window, uh, it, it always made me curious about, you know, what else is out there that I could benefit from precise temperature control within windows and not necessarily just trying to go for my target final core temp. I think that's one of the things that I found really fascinating being on, you know, with sous vide and kind of some of the more cutting edge stuff that people do, the more scientific bents is that I like the two approaches that there's, you know, like scientifically, this should happen if you do it, and then you can test it with the equipment. And then some things you do with the equipment, you're like, I don't know what happened there. Like, the search for the the scientific reason of why that was the result that was the result. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, it's 
this, I think that we're still, we're still going to be learning a tremendous amount. Um, one of my other favorite tricks, uh, and, and, you know, in, in early on, I mentioned that I always believe that sous vide um, intensifies flavor, really brings out the, the most of, uh, in the flavor of food. And Dave Arnold shared a, you know, this tip with me. We were, you know, messing around uh, at FCI and he's trimming a, a piece of beef and then he takes these trimmings and he's just putting a ridiculously hard sear on all the stuff that would normally just go in the bin. And, uh, and then he takes all of that stuff out of the pan and he throws it in the bag with the steak. And, you know, he said, these are just my little Maillard flavor boosters that I'm throwing in. And I thought that was just brilliant because, uh, you know, really, I, that's what we love about the flavor of beef is that Maillard reaction. And he's just throwing Maillard in the bag. And, and you know, that I thought that was awesome. And that's, it really does work really, really well. I love that approach to it, that you're just adding, it's like a Maillard bomb, basically, that you're putting into it. Yeah. With you talking about the uh, the enzyme reactions, I I'm not I'm not a food scientist at all, so I could be getting the thing wrong. But this reminded me of it. I don't know if you know Jamie Simpson from I think it's the the Chef's Garden. He's the it's like the Vegetable Institute um, in nearish Chicago, Illinois area that that region of America. But he does some fascinating things. He was um, we've been talking to him about doing a demo for us where he takes. I want to say it's like a pear or like a plum, something like that. And he sous vides it for, I think it's like one to two months at a, a lower temperature. And the, the reactions that happen in it, it completely changes the color and texture and flavor. And like everything about it is transformed almost like through a, like a fermentation type process. And so he makes these very interesting like transformations between some of the foods. And um, he's someone out there we'll touch base afterwards. I'll send you a, a connect to him. Cause I feel like the two of you would have a good time talking about um, random, random things you could do with sous vide and science in the well, kitchen. But yeah. And I'll watch for uh, when you get him on to share some of those ideas. It's the first time that I've heard like, well, this is a pretty long cook. And I'm like, I understand sous vide. I know it's going to be like a long cook. He's like, no, it's like a two month cook. And I was like, Oh, I, I was not aware of that. That is longer than I was expecting. <laughs> No, I, I get nervous, uh, with anything, uh, you know, anything that's approaching 72 hours, you know, because, uh, you know, as soon as you hit three days, your, you know, anaerobic bacteria becomes a, a factor. So yeah, I get real nervous about that, but yep, I think I forget what the, what the technique is, but it was super cool. And when he was telling uh, Mike and I about it, we were just like, if you want to do that for a demo, yes, we will 100% um, do that. Uh, and Mike uh, was in the comments. He was saying that uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about er uh, everyone's second favorite poly science um, uh, piece of equipment, which is the smoking gun and how you kind of worked on developing that one. Well, that was one of those uh, uh, really bizarre uh, product developments. I had no idea I was going to develop that product. Actually, I had gone into a store, a local store here called Comp USA, and I just went in there to buy some software, uh, you know, computer store that, and I'm walking, you know, just walking down the aisles, and I came across this blister pack product called, you know, a keyboard vacuum cleaner. And I looked at it and I said, that might be the dumbest thing I've ever seen that I'm going to have two, you know, four AA batteries and this little thing that's going to suck air here, or you had the option to blow air, you know, so I could take this little nozzle and blow the air off my keyboard, or blow the dust off my keyboard. And I said, and then I looked at it and I said, wait a minute, if it can suck in here and it can blow out there, then I could just mount a pipe bowl here. Maybe it's inspired through a misspent youth here, but uh, <laughs> uh, 
I bought two of them and I went to the hardware store and I screwed some plumbing fittings and took a screen from a faucet and I put that in there. And then I took a, an old coffee grinder with some, uh, some apple wood chips that I had for my barbecue and uh, ground those up more into a sawdust, turned it on and boom, I had the first smoking gun. And, uh, and I actually built, I took the second one. I said, well, this, I'm having all kinds of fun with this. And I took the second one and I sent it to Wiley Dufresne because if anyone was going to have a, a lot of fun with it, it'd be Wiley. He's, you know, he was always pushing the boundaries. And uh, the next thing I know, then every one of Wiley's friends wants one. And so I, I literally bought all the smoke, all the, the keyboard vacuum cleaners at every comp USA in the Chicago land area. <laughs> And, and, you know, fitted these little pipe bowls on them. And I ended up buying, you know, pot pipe bowls from some supplier in Canada. Um, and then when I realized it was actually going to be a product, I actually tooled it. Uh, and, you know, but it was still pretty close in design to the keyboard vacuum cleaner. I actually went to the same guys in Taiwan making the keyboard vacuum cleaner. And I said, well, if you change this part and add this part, then, you know. Uh, and so I'm sure they, they sold more, they, they built more smoking guns than they ever did keyboard vacuum cleaners. <laughs> you probably wrecked havoc on their inventory management for like that month too. They're like, oh, this is super popular now. We need to like ramp up production and get ready and then like never hear from you again. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, you know, it was a, it was a little scary. Of course, you get into something like that, and, you know, you go from building like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm actually going to make 50 of them, you know, to some guy that says, yeah, well, we, we can do that for you, but minimum order quantity was 15,000. And so, yeah, sure. Let's give it a try. <laughs> There's a lot of restaurants in the country, but that's a lot of smoking guns to have to uh, get out to them. <laughs> yeah, it was. And, uh, you know, but it was just such a fun product. Uh, you know, I, I find, uh, I mean, still, you know, today it's like, you know, I live in Chicago, so there's a lot of the year where I just can't face going out to my barbecue or my smoker. And, you know, so I'll just make my barbecue sauce in the blender and then I stick a tube of, you know, and start throwing apple smoke in there while I stir it. And, you know, I sort of fake my barbecue in the, you know, when it's, freezing cold out here in Chicago. That is definitely allowed. Yeah. Uh, we got my aunt, uh, Judy Jones in here. She says she loves that tool. I think she bought it after the, the ISVA conference when you got your award and uh, spoke about some of the stuff there. She, she was on board. What's uh, some interesting uses for that you've seen people use the smoking gun for that's, you know, more than just smoking meat. It uh, doesn't have to be fancy, but just some, I know some people have used like smoked deviled eggs and I think, uh, Dave Petranzek talks about smoked guacamole as one of his favorite things. I was wondering what you've run across. You know, I always, uh, I saw this used in uh, smoking uh, a wild mushroom soup. Mm. And so I've adopted that technique as well. I just love it. Um, I, uh, I remember going to uh, a party once and uh, serving uh, just bread and butter you know i well i had baked bread so i guess that was kind of special um but it was bread with uh, apple smoked butter and you know there's something just so super simple but it was it's really really good and uh uh you know i also i actually one of the very first videos i ever shot for that product was uh uh, it was just sort of a crack up. I said, you know, okay, you can't just go into a bar anymore and sit down and have your uh, Manhattan and your Cuban cigar. <laughs> so, <laughs> so why not just smoke the Manhattan with Cuban cigar? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way. Add a little bit of aroma where we can't do uh, do yeah. the cigars anymore. <laughs> yeah. And actually one of my favorites is still, um, you know, if I'm having a party, I'll just fill the blender and, you know, turn it on a gentle stir and apple smoke 
the water and then make trays of ice cubes and serve, you know, like if bourbon on the rocks or, or something of that nature um, with smoked ice. And you'll hand someone the drink and they'll be like, I'm not really getting the smoke. Well, yeah, because the ice hasn't melted. You know, and they'll, they'll always come back to you like 10 minutes later, like, wow, you know, <laughs> now I know what you mean. This is, it is a smoke drink. So kind of tough. evolves evolves while they're drinking it and uh, changes up the flavor a little bit while they're going through it. Yeah, it's a constantly changing drink that becomes more and more smoky as you go. Mark Webb says he likes smoked oils and butters and, uh, of, co of course, smoked spirits uh, are some of his favorites to use there. Yeah. And, and, you know, I always get the comments of, well, you know, can I smoke a chicken with this or can I smoke my ribs with it? you could try it's not going to do a whole lot um smoke is going to really tend to uh you know add flavor to some to liquids and you know liquids fats but uh you know if i just shoot it at, shoot the smoking gun at you know some ribs I'm not going to really do much there mm -hmm. um one thing i found interesting though jean georges uh when they roast a chicken they'd actually take it out of the oven and they'd throw, you know, like a, a aluminum foil over it. And then uh, as it was resting, they'd run two full bowls full of uh, like apples, applewood chips and smoke it, uh, you know, right before it was plated. So, I guess you can get some effect if it's if it's got that immediacy right before it goes to the diner. One of my favorite things that I've done with it was it was inspired by a meal I had at a restaurant called the Musket Room, um, which is like modernisty style. Like I, the way that I consider like modernist done in a good way that it was used to enhance the plate, not just oh here's a foam, you know. Um, but they did uh, it was a cold uh, scallop salad that there is thinly sliced scallops. They had some apples and then a bunch of New Zealand ingredients that I didn't recognize what they were, but they put a bowl over the top and they smoked it. So it would come out, it was cold. They take off the bowl and you get all the smoke aroma. And I did sous vide scallops at home, uh, thinly sliced them and kind of did a take on that. And that turned out um, very good that it's like a subtle enough dish that you really get those kind of smoke aromas. It's not competing with ribs or something, you know, that uh, is hard to uh, overpower. You know, one of the coolest techniques I ever saw was uh, Grant Ackett's. Um, he wanted uh, it, it was a, it was fall, and I want to say it was a, a warm potato soup. Could be wrong. I think that was it. Anyway, he had taken a sous vide bag and filled it with um, uh, where he'd just taken like oak leaves, you know, and and. All of us that grew up, you know, from my generation, used to be people would just rake the leaves in a pile and burn them. And so, you know, for a lot of us that the memories of fall are the smell of burning leaves. And Grant does a beautiful job in um, creating dishes that trigger memories. Uh, I've, I've never known anyone like, uh, like him in terms of his, his ability to capture that little piece of, you know, a memory that just takes you way, way back. And so he filled this sous vide bag with smoke from burning leaves and then put it in this little pillowcase and then um, took like a pin and stuck pins. So you'd set the pillowcase then in front of the diner and then they would take this bowl of soup and the weight of the soup started pushing the smoke very <laughs> delicately. You didn't see it, but when you'd lean over to take a, your spoon and uh, take a bite of the soup, you'd get this subtle aroma of the burning leaves. It was just beautiful. I love the, I have not eaten at any of his restaurants, but I love, I've read, you know, his cookbook and, read a lot about the stuff that he does. And I love the way that he approaches just like, I want to get the smell of burning oak leaves 
into this meal? Like, and then what is the best way to approach it? And the things that he comes up with like that, to use a small pillow that the soup's resting on with the smoke in there, like things like that are just amazing. It's always fascinates me just the way that you can, how many different ways you can incorporate scents and flavors and textures into a single dish. It's unlimited and it's fascinating to see people that really push the boundaries of that. Yeah. 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 He's just such an incredible talent. It's so much fun to work with the guy because, uh, you, you know, you, you just never know where things are going to go. Like, you know, when I worked with him, uh, on designing the anti griddle, um, of course I tested it before I brought it over to Alinea, but you know, the only thing I could think of was, uh, oh, okay, I guess I'll make ice cream kind of things on it. And, uh, uh, you know, he, you know, the, the first things he's making on it would be, uh, you know, like taking a dollop of sour cream and putting it on and putting smoked salmon on it. Hmm. And then, um, you know, a little, taking this little, uh, tree of sorrel and sticking it in and then by putting it all the way to the bottom it would freeze in place so it's in the sour cream but it's standing up and the top of the sour cream is liquid the bottom is solid and then take the smoked salmon and microplane it um, over the the sour cream and created this uh you know, savory approach that I would have never dreamed in my wildest imagination to take the anti griddle in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Like that. that's what I first thought of was, you know, obviously having a, a sour cream based tree with smoked salmon grated on it. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, it was just such a, a radically different approach. So what are some things that you, since you have sous vide a ton of things, because you wrote a great book about sous vide, you have been selling it, you've been, you know, consulting with restaurants and talking to chefs. What are some things that you pretty much only cook sous vide now that you're like, this is kind of my go-to technique for this, this specific preparation or specific item? Well, probably um, for me, the, the game changer, you know, the only way to cook scallops for me is sous vide. Um, you know, I think that I've, I guess it's probably because I've, you know, in the, the pan searing approach that we all started out with, I, I've really, you know, those scallops gave their all and I didn't give it back. <laughs> you know, I ended up with some kind of overcook. It was very common that I would overcook them if I was just pan searing them and just nailing the perfect scallop, I always found kind of hard. Um, and so you, you know, you just, as with any seafood, I tend to, I'll start out with a, a brining process and then, you know, quick 10 minute brine, um, vacuum seal, drop them for an hour in a, uh, 125 Fahrenheit bath. Uh, then I'll drop that bag in an ice bath. So I know I've, I've already gotten my core temperature and, and actually I don't want to drive any more core temperature. And that's why I'll ice bath, uh, prior to the sear. And then, uh, you know, just hitting them with a, a fairly quick sear. All I'm after is just putting that little, you know, nice tan, color to the outside of both sides of the scallop and to me it's just absolute perfection can't beat it yeah scallops are all those things that people some people are like well it's easy to do in a pan and i'm always like not for me i was never good at doing it in a pan but if you're good at that my you know more power to you but that's was never my strength <laughs> no no it's you know it i think it's really hard um to get to <laughs> To get them perfect uh, i think also you know i just i love taking uh doing doing almost all of my steaks you know i'll, I'll sous vide them first 
Uh, and again, it's sort of this hybrid approach of I'm going to uh, mark them. I'm going to get a Maillard reaction first, then bag them. Or I put them in the bag and I tend to set my bag in an ice bath because uh, I'm working with a, a you know, big mini pack chamber vacuum sealer. So uh, I don't want to boil proteins. That's one of the most common mistakes I see people make in sous vide cooking is, uh, uh, you know, they buy these beautiful chamber vacuum sealers and then don't have really cold proteins that go in them and they're just, they're boiling. And, and I, I look at it as, you know, you're kind of losing one of the, the great attributes of sous vide cooking. You know, the one that actually the attribute that I think most people miss is the, uh, is the fact that inherently you're, you're going to uh, prevent the weight loss through burst cell structure and moisture loss. You know, as soon as you expose uh, protein to over 70 degrees centigrade, cell structure starts breaking, moisture's coming out, and you know, I don't care how much sauce or char crust or whatever <laughs> you put on it, it that moisture is gone, okay? And you know, I, I think there was some ad on TV, seals in juices. No, it doesn't seal in juices, okay? <laughs> It's gone. And actually, you know, that, that harkens back to, since we're talking history of sous vide, um, Bruno Gousseau was, um, oh boy, and I, I should remember the name of this very famous French chef that asked him to do the work, but since that escapes me, uh, his, his, the reason how he developed sous vide was to cook foie gras. And, um, uh, it was, you know, the, since the raw material was so expensive, they were looking for, okay, how can I cook this and not lose 20 to 25% of, you know, the weight that I purchased. And so that's how he came up with uh, sous vide cooking. And, and um, you know, I actually, I, I got him to, share a story that uh, uh, I always thought was really cool because, um, you know, if you say to Bruno, well, you know, I want my steak to look like this, um, and, you know, you show him a perfectly medium rare, rare steak, he doesn't mean anything to him. He's going to reach in his pocket and grab a temperature probe and shove it in because he's colorblind. So, <laughs> you know, for him, it's all about, you know, you can, you can't show me what you want. I have to measure what you want. And I think that's really what led to, oh, well, if I measure it, then I can control it. And if I control it, but, you know, he knew about laboratory equipment. He, he had been using equipment that I made for, for decades. So <laughs> I think that's interesting that you take something that, a lot of us, you know, kind of take for granted is be able to see, you know, you can see the doneness by the color or whatever. And then having that removed actually makes it like he has to re reassess that. And like now that I've been in more sous vide and stuff, like I realize that like you really can't judge the doneness by the color anyway. And like the temperature is the only way to do it. It's it's always amazing to me when people are like, well, they look at a picture and they say, well, that's overdone or that's underdone. And it's like, you can't judge just based on color that if you, if you cut that steak and then let it sit out for 10 minutes and then you cut off another slice, like those two slices are going to be completely different colors because of the interactions with the air and just like it changes over time. And to have that sense removed that he's like, Oh, now I have to find some other way to do it. And then it kind of hones in on that temperature as a huge determining factor of it is really interesting. Well, and I'm sure you've experienced this too. When, when you say to someone, you know, how do you like your steak? And if they say medium rare, okay, I know what medium rare, I know what temperature that is. But uh, quite often when you serve that sous vide medium rare steak, people will say to you, oh, that's, that's a little underdone. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had that experience as well. And 
And I think it's because they are so used to seeing the traditional cooking method where it's way overcooked, sort of overcooked. Okay, here's your medium rare, and here's here's that little tiny line of undercooked. And and so they're so used to seeing that gradient that when you present them with, okay, here's a coast to coast medium rare, uh, it's it's sort of shocking to them, and uh, you know their their initial reaction is, oh no, this is this isn't you know what I'm used to. It's got to be wrong. Yeah, it's a lot more of the pink than a lot of people are used to. A lot more of the red. And I think people, there's such a wide range, like depending who you ask about like, you know, what are the temperatures that are medium rare, especially when you were talking about like traditional cooking, you know, it's like 128 to like 138 or something like that's a, those are look very, very different. And if someone like I, my mom generally likes the higher end of medium rare, you know, if, and like my dad, like if they're going out, like I'd get a steak, like this is perfectly cooked. And they'd be like, I'd actually prefer it a little bit more done, but they don't want like solid medium or the upper end of medium. So I think you run into people like that a lot that it's like, when I cook it, it's at like 130. And so it's the lower end of what they prefer anyway. And then you have that edge to edge, you know, redness. And I could see how a lot of people would be kind of thrown off by a lot more red and a lot more vibrant red than I'm used to. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have to say, you know, when I, when I'm saying, oh, I like my, you know, I like medium rare. For me, that's 136. But I know that, uh, matter of fact, I bet Dave Petranzik would say that, you know, I'm probably about five degrees high. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's always funny because he cooks so little meat that every time he always jokes about it because we're a very steak heavy <laughs> uh, program in general and stuff. We like our meat here, but he's always like, you know, I don't do that meat like you guys do. Like, that's fine. It's uh, and so he goes into the other stuff. So we, we made him our honorary mascot of our uh, sous vide vegetable showcase, just as a, uh, you know, let him kick that off. And we're like only vegetables, only fruits, you know, non meat stuff just for you, Dave. Yeah. And, and, you know, he's also like kind of pushing the envelope on, uh, you know, doing legumes, you know, doing his, his, doing his beans and all kinds of things, uh, sous vide that I would have never considered cooking that way. That's how I do my beans now is the, the Dave Petranzik, uh, method and it works great. It's super easy and convenient and it's, they turn out incredible every time. Well, you know, I, I'm going to circle back again a little bit to our kind of our history and one of the really cool things um, in you know founding PolyScience, first of all, I have a very successful lab business, so I was able to approach this culinary business as a hobby and you know do it without any mindset of you know how do we maximize profitability and and all of that. No, it was really how do we maximize the fun and. Uh, because no one would, you know, write up a business plan and launch an anti-griddle. You'd have to be nuts. <laughs> and, and a smoking gun, you know, off of, designed off a keyboard vacuum cleaner. You don't, you don't do these things, uh, you know, with your, with the, having the MBA driving it. Um, and I always, I always had a mantra that, you know, we can't design and and build things that uh, are boring. And, and we've got to always be pushing towards something new because I find that, you know, I go to trade shows and it's really hard to find new, you know, it's, it's fine. It's, you see a lot of product evolution, but you just don't see a lot of innovation, real innovation. And so, when I couldn't come up with something new, I'd just tap into uh, dragging some product from the lab industry into the culinary world and taking things like rotary vacuum evaporators that I think they're really cool. And I was using it. Um, actually, I've got a, like a little miniature farm here just north of Chicago. And uh, so I'm using a rotary evaporator to make my Calvados at home. And, uh, you know, I love hard cider, but making hard cider, there were batches that I would make that I'm like, yeah, this just isn't that good. 
you know, and so, and so I, okay, that goes off to the road of app and we're going to see if we can upgrade it into Calvados. And, um, and then actually, uh, so that we, we brought road of app to the, to the market and then, um, kind of an evolution again from that was, uh, uh bringing what's in the lab world. It's called a cell disruptor. We called it the sonic prep, which <laughs> was, uh, bringing high powered ultrasonics to, uh, the culinary world. And, and it, it has a few attributes that are kind of cool. It will infuse flavors just incredibly rapidly. It'll build emulsions. And again, it tied into things I'm doing here at home where if I made the Calvados, it's like, okay, great. It, it's, it's got all the, you know, I, I taste the apple, it's got the alcohol, but I just don't have the patience for three years in oak. <laughs> and so what I do is I just put it in a container and I float oak chips across the top and hit it with ultrasonics. And it works like this 40,000 pulse per second pump, just uh, pushing the Calvados into the fiber of the wood. And literally in three minutes, it turns all the Calvados an amber color. And it's like, I've got three years of oak on it in three minutes. So it's just too much fun. <laughs> I love just like the technique, like uh, taking, you know, these two worlds that you're involved in and taking, you know, equipment from one world and applying it to concepts in another world and seeing how they relate and how they can be used to enhance or speed up or do things more precisely. I think it's an amazing way to approach cooking and moving innovation forward. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I just, I, honestly, I wish there was more time to play with these things because I think there's still tons of opportunities out there. You know, I think, uh, Actually, it's it's interesting. One of the guys that worked with me, and and this was another fun part of this, is starting something this kind of crazy and fun, is that I was always very, very fortunate that I had a lot of wonderful talent that would that wanted to come and have fun with me. And, uh, you know, of course, you know Conrad Serafin and David Petranzik. And, you know, David is, uh, you know, he, he took this to levels, uh, you know, kind of beyond where I ever had the time to, to take it. Uh, another guy that was Christoph Miltz, who worked with me in uh, marketing. Uh, and, you know, it was fun because Christoph would also bring these crazy ideas, you know, like one day he shows up with a, a, a seed press and, you know, he said, I think this is going to be, you know, the next thing restaurants are going to want to do. Well, we never marketed it. We never, you know, but um, we certainly, you know, we had fun with it and, you know, making, uh, I, I think he was getting seeds from uh, vineyards in Michigan and, and just making grape seed oil. And after he left poly science, he, he went off him and his wife and his daughter and his, and his uh, seed press and <laughs> <laughs> he started pressing oils for a few years, having a lot of fun with that. So it's I definitely helpful surrounding yourself with people that are creative and innovative and creating an environment where they're not scared to try things that may or may not work, but to kind of explore what's out there and push the envelope is not every environment is conducive to that. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, it was always, that was always a, a fun thing because we were always really on the hunt for what's, you know, what's next? What, what can we do? You know, cause you earn a reputation as, uh, being an innovative company. And, you know, my standard expression, when I'd walk, uh, you know, the, a show floor, I'd come back and I'd say, yeah, there's a new button on the dishwasher, you know, and that's it. And, it's it really is hard innovation is hard because what you what you find is you just have to be willing to put time money and run the risk a high risk of failure you know more often than not you're going to fail i i know 
Grant came to me once and he said, you know, I want to make snow. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on the phone with, uh, oh, there was a Dr. Lambert at Caltech. He wrote a book on making snow. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to him, how do I make snow? And I ended up building this chamber and uh, I had uh, a metered spray of liquid CO2 that was coming out at minus 156 degrees and swirling. And, and then, I was ta- then I took fresh squeezed strawberries and I put them in an airbrush and atomized them into this chamber. Uh, and, and actually, I was able to grow snow. Uh, And it was really cool because it was just this beautiful, fresh squeezed strawberry snow. But it took me about 25 minutes to make one bowl of snow. (laughs) And and I realized, I don't know how, you know, how could you put something on a menu? You know, it was great. You know, I agreed. My wife and I had a bowl of snow (laughs) and I only worked for an hour and a half to get it. (laughs) <laughs> but, I always looked yeah. at that as it's a one of these days someone will will figure it out and uh I think it'll be really cool because again you know like like I said earlier about guys like Grant he has this incredible talent to connect us back and bring memory and what kid at least in where I grew up what kid didn't want to eat snow you know we all wanted to have that bite us fresh snow, you know, but now if you could have like some really good, you know, something that like is a wow factor and it's a total different experience from like, you know, a snow cone, that's some shaved ice stuff. No, I'm talking, you know, Colorado powder. (laughs) And that's a hard thing to achieve. Mark says that sounds amazing, just not the yellow kind. You definitely would want to be careful what what color of seasoning you put in. Yeah, exactly. Chris, Mark also, oh, go oh, ahead. Oh, you could mess with people. You know, you put it on the menu that's yellow snow. <laughs> yeah, that very true. You can have a some nice uh, a brown moose yeah. on the side and some yellow snow, and it'd be uh, definitely take you back to childhoods yeah. experiences we'd all want to forget. <laughs> Uh, Mark also said that uh, talking about extraction, he says, Mark says a lot of things that I don't understand, but often the guests do understand because him and the guests are often a lot smarter than I am. But he says uh, super critical CO2 extraction also produces some really interesting aromatics and uh, liquids, by the way, when you were talking about doing some of the different extraction techniques. That's one of the things that he likes to do. Yeah. Yeah few other comments have come in. Uh, Kevin was wondering if my haircut changes every week on purpose or if that's just accidental. It, that is just accidental because I usually forget to to do much with it beforehand. So it just uh, comes out. And, uh, and Mike uh, says he wants to be your neighbor. <laughs> awesome. Well, we don't, you know, it's, it is just having fun. That's, that's the trick. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that it doesn't matter really what you're engaged with. Uh, you know, it's it, lately, uh, and actually, uh, just so your viewers know this, I, I had uh, sold the culinary division of poly science to Breville because having three young children and attending every laboratory show and every culinary show in the world, uh, kind of led to quality of life issues. And I actually really was getting stretched kind of thin. And, you know, it was my hope actually that, you know, a company that had, you know, greater resource could take this to the next level. Um, and and I think, you know, as you know, they've recently launched a, a new sous vide unit. And I've had, uh, I was She's involved. Right there. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I was involved uh, in in a lot of the early design work on it, and uh, as was Dave Petranzik and and Conrad, and um, you know, I think that it's a really really fine unit. I think it's you know it's funny because you know I'm of 
course, on all of the Facebook pages. And um, I see that the most common question is, I just bought this, what time and temperature? And, you know, I keep thinking, oh, if they had that unit, all they do is just plug in. Here's the size, you know, the, the type of protein, the size, and uh, give me your time and temperature. So uh, it's, it's a pretty awesome product. But, um, yeah, lately I've been, you know, working on things like uh, temperature control equipment for bioreactors uh, to make vaccines. So oh, nice. that's a huge one for us lately. I mean, I like a perfectly cooked steak, but that does sound probably a little more important in the the long term. <laughs> well, I don't know. You got to have both. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and yes, I do love the Hydro Pro. Um, it's an amazing machine. It's the you know the first machine that I have bought in probably eight years because um, I've test enough that people send them to me. And you know, I still remember the first machine that you sent me when I was just getting started as a blogger. And you know. It, I think I passed it on to someone else after like eight years of use and it was still chugging along perfectly. And then seeing this one and hearing Dave Petransek talk about how excited he was about how it was built. I just, it's like, yeah, it's time for to actually buy one. That's I think will hopefully last me another, you know, eight to 10 years. And uh, it's a perfect machine so far. I've been loving it and works really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really nice piece. Um, I, uh, I guess, you know, I would, I only wish they would uh, open it up more to the consumer market, you know, because I, I think they really put a target on the professional market. But, um, you know, I look back on uh, when we launched uh, the sous vide professional back in 2010, uh, we were actually quite successful in the consumer market, even at a $799 list price, which now, that's a lot of money for someone to pony up for their home kitchen. Yep. Yeah. But we've seen, we've sure seen a lot of people uh, investing in their home kitchens, especially during pandemic, right? <laughs> We're all spending a lot more time in them. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, Philip, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your expertise, sharing your stories. I, it's always a joy to talk to you and just hear about all the amazing things that you've been a part of over the years. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day and coming on and talking to all of us. It's my pleasure, Jason. You know, there's a uh, few of us that have been at this for quite some time, and uh, your efforts have always been an inspiration. Uh, you know, and we look back and I, I know Dave Arnold isn't so involved anymore. And, uh, you know, I look at uh, the work that uh, Doug Baldwin did, you know, I mean, we all, you know, there was, there were certain people that really were critical to, you know, providing that little piece of information or in my case, uh, that piece of equipment. And, uh, you know, we've all really advanced sous vide cooking tremendously. And I'm glad to see you're still out there on the front lines doing it. <laughs> still out there fighting the good fight, getting sous vide out there to everyone. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And if people want more from you, they can go to polyscience.com. And for more on the circulators, they can go to polysciencecullinary.com slash collection slash sous vide circulators. Uh, again, Phil, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And it was wonderful catching up again. Good talking with you, Jason. Thanks. And thanks to everyone in the comments and that are listening. Remember, you can join us live when we record these episodes. You can ask the guest questions, talk to the other cooks in the comments, and even see our smiling faces. So join us at afmeasy.com slash show or search for Exploring Sous Vide on your favorite podcast platform. This has been Exploring Sous Vide. We're all about helping you get the most out of your sous vide machine while talking to some of the biggest names in the industry. Till next time, I'm Jason Logston. See you all next time.